Look at Sheffield. I'm here at Cole's Corner. It's like a record shop. It's got a cafe here and also exhibition. Look. So it's got lots of my work there. See that? That's the scream. That one up there, Extinction. That's a red build woodpecker. This week, extinct. Lamb of God. Anyway, there's lots of pictures up there and I've been sitting here talking with some old friends and that. We've been talking about like, oh, what the fuck have you been doing? So I've got a friend here and he hasn't seen me for like a, a long time. Got two friends here, they haven't seen me for a long time. So I started to explain to them um, what I've been doing since the last time I saw them. And I was showing them like when I nailed my foot to the wall, <laughs> pulling the bus with my big toe, rolling and crawling. And they're like, fucking hell, what are you being over? Because I've got all these paintings up here. And it's really weird, isn't it? Because like, um, uh, that's your sort of like uh, your, your physical art history. That's my own art history from uh, when I went into treatment and started painting in, uh, um, in the mental hospital. And they said to me, paint a portrait of yourself and then um, paint a portrait of yourself, how you think other people see you. And I used to sit in this art room all the time and just paint and paint. I was painting before then in a garden and they just said to me, um, um, oh, you should go to art college. And where I grew up in Peckham and Camberwell, there was a really famous art college, Camberwell College of Art. It's quite prominent, it's on the Peckham Road and beside it is um, the South London Gallery. And I remember like years and years ago when I was a kid going into that, it was like a watercolour, uh, Sunday painters, there was the London group and other things like that. But um, it got taken over as well by, um, uh, they started to put on uh, Gavin Turk, Tracy Emin. This was about the time when I was, um, this was Brit art, explosion of Brit art. So there was a lot of art and a lot of people going to art galleries. He said to me, you should go to art college. I love painting. I love like doing lots of different things. And I went to, um, I came from the treatment place and I went to the interview. I was in like, um, I, I was 37, got taken into care by the local council and they put me into First and House in Campbell, uh, in Clapham. I was in there for months and that's where I was painting. But I came out of there and went for my interview and then you couldn't get, I couldn't get onto the degree course. They said, you have to do foundation, which you have to pay for. And I didn't have any money. And um, so I went to the college, I enrolled to go. <laughs> and when they said pay, I said, I haven't got any money. And they <laughs> said to me, oh, you can't come here if you haven't got any money. And I was like, uh, what can I do then? And I was sitting there and they said, like, uh, way over there. They left me there all day. Like, no, I'm going. <laughs> and I was just thinking, oh, you know. And I came back the next day then. I was, I was a bit disappointed. And I was thinking, how am I going to get into this college? I came back the next day and there was another person there and I was speaking to them. And they said, um, oh, someone wants to see you actually. So it was like, um, his name was Richard Hughes and he was like the deputy head of the college. And I went in there and I was like, he was saying to me, you know, different things about like my art and what I was doing. It was really funny as well. So when I turned up, I didn't have like, um, I had a lot of stuff that I'd been painting, you know. It wasn't really great, but it was quite sort of like outsiderish, but it was a lot. I had to get a van to take it there as well. So he said to me that he's got some money and he's going to pay for it. I was like, fucking hell, no way. So he said, yeah, it's a special fund set aside <laughs> <laughs> for when people like you show up. Because I was actually from Peckham, do you know what I mean? I was from North Peckham Estate, and it was like, I was in a little bit of trouble. And I think also that um, when they do those intakes, they, they have to like, yeah, we got a few from the hospital, <laughs> a couple of people. <laughs> it's still a little bit in trouble but they can, they can come as well just to mix it up a bit with the other students so yeah they let me in and then and then i just went on and done um, the degree course at camberwell and started teaching there after there so i'd come from this really sort of like quite sort of like chaotic background for a long time and then it ended up like 
I was uh, working at um, Chelsea on the MA course. I went to Goldsmiths as well, which was to do like, um, it was history of art, but it got changed to visual culture, which was set up by a couple of people, Howard Cagill and Surat Maharaj. But it was all thinkers, and I said, this really isn't the place. But I had a tutor at Camberwell, Paul O'Kane, and he was quite theory-based. And I really wanted to, like, work out, like... At the time, because of what was happening with Brit art, a lot of this stuff was really conceptual. You know, we had people like, you know, Martin Creed and all sorts of fucking... Like, I was thinking, how the fuck is that art? <laughs> you know... It was really mad to someone who was really sort of like off their heads, quite hedonistic for a long time, to be told when you arrive at college that you can do anything that you want to do. That's when I started doing all the performances. And it was really extraordinary because um, it, had a, it had like a little bit of power. I ended up on the fucking Richard and Judy show. You know, it was like... I went to New York, I dressed up as George Bush and I had a sign, I, I taped a sign to my posterior which said, kick my ass. And I did it on, um, it was President's Day in New York. It was President's Day, it was February, I forgot the day. And I came from the Lincoln Center and um, New York's really liberal and George Bush, it was, I think it was about 2007. And it was like, everyone was kicking me. <laughs> I'd, like, put some trainers down, like, the back of my jeans as well, just for a bit of, sort of like, protection. But um, it was a couple of out-of-towners there, and there were, all the media was there. I was on the front page of the Metro, the New York Metro, and all, lots of the other page, papers as well, and on the telly. But there was CNN was there, and there was this girl, Wanda, and she had this massive camera, and I'd been chatting to her before, and she had her... Um, her a co-conspirator anyway, the one with the microphone. And this guy started shouting. And I turned around and there was two of them and they were twins. They were like from, like they had really southern accents. And they were screaming at me. They were absolutely <laughs> screaming at me. And they looked around at everyone and they were just like, saw the cameras and he, and he went, don't kick him in the ass, don't kick him in the ass. You ain't kicking George W in the ass, you're kicking America in the ass. <laughs> And that wonder at the time, she had this massive like, camera and she turned the camera towards him and he just smashed the camera out of her hands. He said, get that goddamn camera out of my face. Oh, I was fucking, I was crawling <laughs> to get out of there because you know, it's hairy in those situations. And I was by myself, I didn't have a minder or anything. I was just going around like doing these performances. I was saying earlier on, crawling through Eltham with like, um, could you love me on my back? And like, just, you know, get, you're getting abused. Like, you get abused if you're out there doing strange things in the streets. We were talking about this the other day because you have film, you have television, books, and we read things, not everything, but we read things quite linear. When you look at things, like it's a story, it begins and ends. And when people start doing strange things, like in the street, or acting out of, like, normal. It's really weird for them, and, it, and it's very difficult because we're all, we're like, a lot of art is shame-based. So shame is, like, one of the biggest things, like, see, like can you sing a song? Who's, who's going to sing the next song? And it, <laughs> not me. Do you know what I mean? You can go to places where they actually, they create everything for you, everything. You can go to a disco, you can go to a bar, They've got drink, they've got alcohol, they've got subdued lighting, they've got smoke. They have like a fucking black and white floor. And they've got music pumping out. And your friend says, come on, let's go out and... I ain't fucking dancing out there. <laughs> because they're scared to dance, because they think that they're like, you know, oh, fucking, I don't know how to dance. You know, it's really difficult. So there's this real sort of like um, shame attached to... Um, um, art in general like even if like it's a big struggle for someone playing the guitar at home singing songs someone like writing poetry it's a big struggle for them to go to the next step which not even to be published but maybe you know to go and play in a local bar or like read poetry 
uh, or publish it online or anything like that. You know, it's really, really difficult. And um, I don't know why it is the way that people read things. You know, like the Extinction Rebellion. Do you remember, like, um, a couple of years ago, they were, like, out in Trafalgar Square and there was this massive group and they were doing this wild, like, um, earth. <laughs> they were, like, painted, like, flowers, but there were some, they were just, like, you know, and they was, like, doing some kind of dynamic meditation where they were, like, fucking really rocking. And some other people were just, like, floating. And it was, like, connection, and they were playing drums. And it was on the fucking Twitter. It had like 9.8 million views. Because <laughs> everyone was laughing at them. They were laughing at them. They're going, look at them. Look at them. <laughs> I said, what the fucking hell are they doing? And I think that that's like, that's what all our biggest fears, do you know what I mean? And that's connection to art. When, because when you're a kid, you know, you remember as well, like when you was like maybe 10, 11, 12, you were, like you used to have those easels and bull bulldog clips with the paper and you'd give you some paint and you'd be painting a boat and fucking David what's his name would be on your shoulder going <laughs> what's that what what's that <laughs> it's a boat it's a fucking boat and he'd be laughing he's fucking he'd be calling everyone else from the class over fucking <laughs> he said it's a boat it's a fucking boat which is really sort of like, if you've ever seen Cy Twombly's um, uh, painting of, uh, it was uh, an interpretation of Turner's, uh, what's the one where the tugboat is like pulling it back? What's that called? What's it called? No, it's that Turner painting where they tug it back. Yeah. And he, done, he just like done that. And he's got a massive fucking canvas and he just went like that, you know, like like the, the hull of a boat and the line up. I think he'd done maybe two lines. It's fucking amazing. The Fighting Temerary. The Fighting Temerary. Yeah, it was an old tugboat. It's like the, the sun was setting. Do you know what? If you go to the gallery, it's in the, I think it's in the National Gallery, the Fighting Temerary. If you go there, you'll be able to see that fucking sunset. It's extraordinary. And when you get closer to it, you can see the circle that you drew with the pencil. Right where the sun is. You get up close, there's no fucking sun. You can see the pencil. It's fucking amazing. Yeah. Who's that? That's Giotto, isn't it? Did he, well, like, they were saying, do you know Giotto? He was, like, he was the first, um, the first 3D artist, Italian Renaissance, well, like, 14th century. But anyway, they wanted um, for the, they had to get like someone who was going to come and paint fucking something. So they had a lo load of people come in and they were like, show us your painting skills and they're bringing their paintings in. Anyway, Giotto, as the story goes, he turns up, he was like, I think he was the son of a sheep farmer and he turns up and they're like all the whatever they are in Italy, what are they called? Like barons or whatever. He said, what can you do? And Joe took the pencil, and he went like this, look. And he drew, he drew <laughs> the perfect fucking circle. That's true, well, that's what they say. He drew the perfect circle. Yeah, he was, um, yeah, it's extraordinary. I mean, I started after that, like when I was in the library, I went to uni and um, I went to the library and I thought, I, I joined, and I didn't just join the library, I got a job in the library. So I could look at every single artist. I wanted to know, like I'd just come from treatment. So I wanted to know every single artist that there was and what they did, what their style was, what their paintings was. And I remember I found a book by, um, I've uh, forgotten his name. This is fucking when I should have my I got my iPad. Who's the guy? Like, he wrote the book about Vasari. So, he wrote a book about being an art, like, not just being an artist, but about material. 
and it was about like um, how to make egg tempera, you know, how to um, is it rabbit skin glue? <laughs> how to make all these things? It was really amazing. But the thing, one of the things that um, he was really interested in, a lot of the Renaissance, what they all wanted to do was um, make them last forever. It, they were interested in, like, permanence. They wanted to make it last forever. It's really weird, because, like, a lot of the work that I do, they got pastels on it as well. Look at that one there, step back. So that's, like, pastel. Those pastels, like, you start, like, shaking that, they'll, like, start falling off. You have to be really careful. I'm quite... Who's that guy? The old guy who used to burn everything. Gustav Metzger. So, we're here for an art chat. <laughs> Gustav Metzger. He's really... He, he, he's the one, he hung, hung up sheets and he poured acid on them because he wanted them to disappear. Or he had, like, a big fucking one of those burner things. He was hanging around with a guy called David Madala. I ended up hanging out with him. David Madala, he died recently, and he was a very old uh, Filipino who started a thing called the London Biennale. And, um, yeah, we used to do loads of performances for him and really hang out. So, yeah, that, that was, like, when I was, like, doing all that, that was a really big attraction as well, was the, um, the actual art scene. So there was a lot of sort of like um, going to get, I don't know, I haven't done that for such a long time now. But there was a really like going to all the galleries and like, yeah, and then, and then the internet came and that's YouTube in 2007, around about Twitter, I think I got in 2010. And then it became a different medium. So I gave up like, sort of like pushing monkey nuts and rolling and crawling and setting fire to myself and started um, The Artist Taxi Driver. So that all started because as artists, if you haven't got a studio, you've got to work on the kitchen table. So you're looking at like little paintings or now you've got a phone. Then they made the iPhone as well. So you've got YouTube and the iPhone coming out at the same time and they connected and you can make a video and then post it. And I was making a video in my car and it was, partic it was about freeze. Have we talked about this before? It was about freeze, and um, that's when I became the artist taxi driver, because someone said, are you a taxi driver? And I wasn't, but like I said, yeah, I'm the artist taxi driver. So that started off like um, an obsession, like make, so also having an addictive personality, there's a lot of art, you know, so a lot, like I make a video every single day. Imagine since 2010, you're in 2022 <laughs> you can count the days that I haven't like like made a video or like even if like you counted the ones when I made two or three I bet I made more videos than days so it's like that's when someone said to me like I was applying to go to Chelsea and they said oh you've got to go and do some paintings if you want to go there because you're going on a painting course and I was making videos so I had about a week and I'd done like fucking, I got every bit of wood and just painted on it. So when the people came from Chelsea to interview me, I just had like so much. And I said to him, he said to me, oh, it must have taken you a long time to get all these paintings together. How long have you been? And I said, no, I've done these in the last, in the last week. <laughs> I did it for you. I did it for you. They told me you were coming and they told me that you like painting. So I did it for you, I said to him. <laughs> You know, he must be thinking, <laughs> fucking nutter. He said, mate, he, I remember him saying to me, he said to me, this isn't an art practice, looks like addiction. <laughs> he said, I said, it's right. Do you know what was really funny the other day? And I, I went into the post office to post out some of my um, new anti-Tory calendars and watercolours. I, mean, I was in the post office and then um, the woman behind the thing, She's really funny, she's quite loud. And she said, yeah, you're, you do paintings, don't you? And I said, yeah, and it's, it's all paintings in here. I said, yeah, and, and prints and things like that. What kind of paintings do you do? <laughs> no, because she chats all the time. And I, and I got my phone out and I showed her the one of the autumn tree and just slid along a couple. Oh, that's so nice. Where did you learn to paint? Did you learn to paint inside? She said to me. <laughs> 
And I looked around, there's fucking people in the queue. I said, how do you, think, how do you know that? Because I was in, kind of inside, inside the murderers. But I had my Sergio Tacchini on as well, so maybe she thought, <laughs> yeah. He likes a bit of prison clobber. It was really, really bizarre. Like, I didn't know what to say, but I just carried on with the conversation and just said, yeah, it's amazing, amazing how you can turn your life around. I said, because my friend did that, she said. I said, did he? <laughs> my friend went to, and he came out and he painted. Yeah. See, see that art then, so art is like a very beautiful thing because we live in it like whatever's happening in the country. Do you want to go into a bit of politics for a minute? It's fucking mad out there at the moment. Absolutely, absolutely mad. So this morning I did the, the thing with the Daily Mail. It is technically, this is my art now. I do paper review. So that's just something we should clear up. The paper review, the artist taxi driver, is a fine art critical practice. Like underneath, like identify not just as a, you know identify as a performance art, but also like a fine. So just so we know that <laughs> people, yeah. So anyway, and so in the Daily Mail this morning, in the art review, uh, newspaper review, um, front page it said finally. At last, they were like fucking celebrating. <laughs> and inside, inside, uh, there's a picture of the army. Our boys are gonna deliver. <laughs> they were fucking celebrating, celebrating the collapse of the fucking country. Celebrating not only no petrol, not only no gas, fucking more taxes. We got, we, we got a pandemic. We got, we got Brexit. We got every single fucking thing you can think of. And they're celebrating, like, the demise of the country. But they are not telling people anything near, like, what they should be knowing. Like, the government. Like, like this week with Keir Starmer when he said, make Brexit work. Every single person in the entire country knows. They can see with their own eyes right in this moment. Because they can't get out. They, they, they know that they, there's no potatoes in the fucking co-op and no eggs on the same day. It's extraordinary. No potatoes and no eggs. Never seen anything like it. And then they say all the... Gap, and it's like everything, everything that people think about is like not only like not talked about. It's not even like... I mean, what did, yeah, let, let's make Brexit work. But Boris Johnson, he, he always says things like, um, like last week when it was really bad, galactic Britain, I'm sending rockets into space. And then, then he'll say, don't worry about the fuels, it'll, it'll be all right. You know, Boris has saved Christmas. You know, everyone can see for their own eyes that quite possibly Brexit, just by itself, just by itself, Brexit, is probably the biggest mistake in this country's entire history. This is worse than it, it probably like it's bad now. <laughs> it's it's outside of any war has it ever been this bad? And the, and the attitudes. What did Boris Johnson say last night on the news night? What did he say? Like, don't worry about your cancer. What did he say? Something about your cancer and your. Just worry about your wage growth. It was crazy. And you had the other guy the other day. What did he say? Something about um, got to like smash the, like the minorities. It's crazy. It's absolutely astonishing. And there's not no one prepared to tell the no. I mean, can you even imagine seeing that like you know that, that we like not just HGV drivers, because I was reading today in the paper, they were actually saying there is like a labour crisis in almost every single sector. How, 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 where, where? <laughs> and everyone knows, how is nobody, nobody, not anyone in the media, not anyone on the TV, standing up and saying, Brexit is a, is a mistake. Why? When you can actually see things physically, you know, when, it's just ridiculous. It really is ridiculous that no one, they think it was it. Even Lisa Nandy the other day, they said, what about freedom of movement? And she said, well, there's no appetite on either side of politics for that. 
Well, they said, no, no, just tell the truth. Just tell the truth. We're fucked. If we ain't got HDV drivers, if we ain't got carers, if we ain't got people, like, there was nothing was even happening before. Nothing was happening. You know, was it, was it bad? Like, you could just travel. But now, you could be a HGV driver in France or Italy or Poland. You could drive around Europe, come over, drive around Britain for a month, drive back. But now you need a passport. So, and, they're, like, they're not even welcome because they're, like, even saying, like, you've got to leave on Christmas Eve. And I think, like, when you're doing, like, that's when my, like, brain starts. Like, when I say, it's, oh, it's a fine art critical practice. And then you're thinking to yourself... Well, actually, you're engaging in the polit- politics and you're trying to, like, talk about it. Like, in, in, in quite an honest way, like, most of the time. And I don't think people, like, even... Because, because they invest, you see? They invest in the media, they invest in the government, or they invest in political parties. And um, it's very difficult for people, for anybody, to admit they're wrong or to say, like, this fucking isn't really good. You know, this is looking worse. You know, we had, like, we're just, like, 20 miles from France. We had the whole of Europe. It's fucking massive. 27 countries. We got all of that. And now we got nothing. Nothing at all. We're back of the queue. Back of the queue in America. How does that work? Because we're fucking, like, run by, like, people who... Who, who, who craved power. Who craved power and thought that taking a particular political stance, that they, could, they had enough chance to convince people that, that this is the way, <laughs> this is the path we should take. It'd be amazing. And it's like, fucking, it's gone further and further right. Like, and the people, the, people around Boris Johnson and all those, like, fucking, those politics of, of um, you know, he's got pretty Patel, it's appalling. Like, you know, wave machines in the fucking sea pushing them back send fucking you know you would you would, you would give any human being any we've all got souls any human being that asks for help apart from poor people or or immigrants people struggling for their life in the sea you know if you saw anyone struggling you know how many people if you saw someone in in, in anywhere but they they have this thing where and the whole thing with brexit it was surrounded by um you know, juxtaposed in images of um, uh, refugees. It was a refugee. It was a, a, a refugee crisis, not a European crisis. They were drowning off the coast of Lampedusa. You know, and all of that. They used that. They they used that as a as a key for power. And it's like um, it's so simple, and it seems so easy. But then they have all the control of the narrative, and that's going back to like. Um, the newspapers and, and, and the government and how they can say whatever they like this is what we've been talking about a lot or what I've been saying and this is if you say it if you say it it's real and for people when they when they look at it the front page of the Telegraph this morning it, it had this incredible like little short thing that Oliver Dowden the minister for for whatever is like um, saying that we are the party of low tax. You know, Boris is out there. He's going to be cutting taxes. It's like, wow. Literally, next year will be the highest tax in this country for 70 years. But they think if they put that on, if they say that, it's like when Boris said the other day, I'm going to send, ro- I'm going to send galactic Britain. I'm going to send rockets to outer space. It's real. It, because if you say it, it becomes real, and that's the that, that's that's the sort of um, things that I learned when I was doing those performances. Um, so it's all about the narrative. So you have the event, and and the narrative exists before, during, and after the event. So the narrative before the event, like we talked about this before, if I'm going to eat a small corgi dog, I. I send press release, say, artist eats a small corgi dog. And they do that. And they put it up. Now, even this is before the event. If you read that in the, in the, in the newspaper, it exists. It exists. So you can say anything. That you're going to do anything. 
the event itself, let's go on to the other two narratives. The event itself, if it's performance art, it's generally fucking shit. And if you visually, you know, my one, <laughs> it was too, it was gone. Do you know what I mean? But it wasn't, you know, it's more, so during, it's more about um, the actual narrative is alcoholics and children on the street interacting. The, the, the narrative, the last narrative, which is the narrative after the event, can be anything that you want it to be. And you can tell the story of your experience in the way that you want it to be. And it can exist like that. And as the artist, you have ultimate power in saying, this is what it was about, this is what happened to me. Because when I'm doing a performance, quite often I'm the best, or I'm the number one. I'm the front row, I can see it all. So I get all the experience. But I can also tell a story. So. You can do it in a way that you you sort of like captivate people. You can really... I had to do this thing where when I crawled to Canterbury on my hands and knees, I had to go for training at the BBC where um, it was for the radio. So I was wired up. So what they actually do is they, um, um, they help you to understand how to describe things to people that can't see the, the thing. So... I think his name was Connor, Connor something, Connor McGinn or something. No, it wasn't Connor McGinn as a politician. Connor, he's, he's, was with ITV last time I saw him. But anyway, he would teach me, he would say to me, like, think, I would, I would actually practice in outside. Like, describe the sound, not just describe the sounds, you know, say where you are, the name of the street, the cars that are actually passing by you. The bus that is where the people are looking out the window, the the the, the spittle, <laughs> they're chewing gum. You know, describe it. You know, tell um, your experience around. If they hear someone talking, oh, that's like a gentleman in in like a um, big yellow jacket who looks like he's on holiday with a camera. You know, he's thinking, asking me, what am I doing? So you have to describe things. It was really interesting as well describing or narrative but it's the power of the of what you end up with isn't it so then they're allowed to who is it cummings dominic cummings the art of war come zoo he said it you know i decided to lie was it i decided to lie do you know in that speech you can watch online he said something like i decided that if you lied you could say anything you want and it doesn't matter because every, no one, it doesn't really doesn't matter. I think he said that, maybe it wasn't lie, but it was something along those lines about not telling the truth. And it, and it has enormous power. Like me with my power as the artist, like when I was allowed to sort of like say, it was my project. But then they, with their power, they're dis- it's like incredible power, not just because um, it can be buttressed by the media, it's because Lots of what we talked about, people investing in their, in their, in their sort of like, um, in their newspaper. So they believe it. You know, we all got family and, and friends who, who, who believe sort of like news from somewhere and some from somewhere else. But um, the Daily Mail sells a million newspapers, not online, physically, in a physical sense. They sell a million or 900,000 a day, every day of the week. It's extraordinary power, you know, and a lot of it, it's not even like, um, it's almost like political pamphleteering. You know, what they're actually doing is political pamphleteering. And it's like, you know, today's one, it's just extraordinary. You look at that and you, but it's every day. (laughs) They do it on purpose as well. You just think, no, don't fuck, what are you doing? How can you say that? How can you be like that? How can you believe that? And then that makes everybody else, everyone's watching that because they buy that newspaper every day. They kind of believe the news that they, they read is quite factual. Loads of it is common, but loads of it is editorial. And that's just like the political beliefs of, of that newspaper. And if it's for the government in power, what chance have you got? No one's got a fucking chance. You know, he's actually presiding over a fucking a catastrophe. And he said, like, not even last night when he said, just worry about wage work. He said, 150,000, let the bodies pile high. You know, that's the prime minister of a country. Um, there was no comeuppance 
for that. There was no sort of like, um, like even for like the disaster now, you don't see like his fucking, you know, leveling any blame, leveling any blame at fucking Boris Johnson. You know, in the, in, even even cheerleading that the army's coming in. You know, it's extraordinary. It's almost like the government, Boris Johnson, has saved you. That's what they're saying. So first of all, he fucks the entire country by the champ- being the champion of Brexit. So now we've got no fucking trade. We've got no HGV lorry drivers. We've got no food on the shelves. Gas is going through the fucking roof. <laughs> and they're championing because he's got the army to come in to bring petrol, emergency supplies. It's extraordinary. His own fucking thing. But they're, champ- they, they, they're like, they're cheerleading it. How, 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 in any sense, can you defeat that? It's, it seems like almost impossible. Because I remember that time when, what did Trump say? I could shoot someone on Fifth Avenue and I'd still... It's extraordinary. Boris Johnson, shoot someone on Fifth Avenue. <laughs> 150,000, let the bodies pile away. And there's, they're like, they've gone eight points clear in the polls. You know, and a lot of that is, is driven by, like, you know... Um, the what they call the culture wars, you know. It's uh, it's it's making the whole country like fear, dread, and it's purposeful because they want a crisis, you know. Because that guy who said, like, I wake the banking guy. He was an actor. He was someone who jibbed on the BBC once, and he said something really outrageous, like, um, I wake up every single morning, wake waiting for another financial crash because he knows and that's you can see like whether it's like the Iraq war whether it's like um, the financial crash whether it's um, um, austerity whether it's like Brexit whether it's the pandemic state of perpetual crisis it's not even been normal (laughs) ever you know, and it's like, so the crisis bit, it becomes like they become the protectors. They're like, like today, he's saving, like with the petrol, like Boris is going to save Christmas. And what was it? How many died after he said he was going to save Christmas? <laughs> it was like after Christmas. They even sent the kids back for another day of school, knowing there was like fucking... <laughs> no one had any like anything and it was like they were, he just let people die because he wanted that front page on the fucking Daily Express that he saved Christmas it seems extraordinary that he can get away with it but it doesn't when you know that like you understand words and the power of narrative and what we've been talking about that are or like you know how you can just say a sentence I mean the Beano show in the Somerset House, I told you about this, and there's a guy in the Beano show, and his name's, he's in my room. I'm in um, Roger the Dodger's room. No, yeah, Roger the Dodger. And I'm in there with um, um, Clay Zoldenberg. He's about 93 years old. He's a sculptor, and he's the guy who builds massive, like, out, giant cherry on a spoon, or like he's got a big gun tied in a knot outside the UN building. He has a lipstick, giant, like, outsized thing. Um, but he also writes um, proposals and, like, really mad. Like, I did say this the other day as well. He wanted to build a statue of John F. Kennedy, uh, um, the size of the Statue of Liberty in a single brass, and then invert it into the ground in Central Park, and then his shoe cut out a golf hole and you could look down inside it and you could see the inner side of John F. Kennedy and they're really you know they're really sort of like you can say whatever you want and it becomes real you know it exists it exists as a thing and that's that, that that's just what they're doing and that's how that's how they're sort of like um, winning the culture war well are they winning the culture war GB News is fucking <laughs> But it's mad because everyone on Twitter laughs. But then if you go look at things on Facebook, it's a fucking completely different story. Do you know what I mean? And on different other platforms as well. Because they, they have, they have, you know, they have like 
captured the nation. And not only have they captured the nation, they've got like the entire sort of political... Imagine this, right? They have the entire political apparatus in their palm of their hands. Boris Johnson and all of his, like the people that are behind him, all the political apparatus, not just the army, he's got the army out, not just that, he's got everything. And that's why they've been talking about like he's diverting money, doing different things and all sort of like, he's divvying up like monies, like monies that should go to certain sort of like poorer places. All the money's funneled to like Tory councils. What is it like 47 out of 49 or something of all the money, the billions that went out, went to Tory councils. You know, it's extraordinary, sort of like, not just levels of like incompetence and sort of like, you know, just outright corruption. Like, it looks like corruption. And like, you think to yourself, right, that mad Hancock, Matt Hancock, he's got like the pub landlord and he's got like fucking, but they all, there was so many, it doesn't, you see that, um, what's he, uh, Jolly Amon, he got like fucking masses of like people taking all sorts of money for like, 10 times, 20 times, 50 times the price of... You can see, should have cost one pound each. <laughs> 50 pound each. And they didn't work. And it's like they've got so much money. 